I'm a musculoskeletal radiologist, uh, one of nine at the University of Wisconsin. Um, I have been fortunate enough to uh, use the Explorer supersonic unit in our lab, mainly on a research basis, and excited to share with you our experience today with musculoskeletal imaging. I'm no magician, but that's an old picture of me <laughs> before I went into radiology. So these are my disclosures. So I want to touch on three points on this 15-minute talk. Uh, the first part is why MSK ultrasound. Some of you may be familiar with musculoskeletal ultrasound, but we're seeing an explosion in the United States and just trying to discuss why that is. We'll talk about how can shear wave elastography for the MSK system can add value to this, as well as when can we expect to translate shear wave, ela shear wave elastography into clinical practice. So what's the background? The big picture here is that musculoskeletal ultrasound has been around for quite a bit of time, mainly in Europe and in Canada. The first paper actually on ultrasound and in the musculoskeletal system occurred in 1979 from the Skeletal Radiology Journal. Uh, it's been around since MRI actually, but really hasn't caught on uh, in the United States and I'll explain reasons why. However, a few early universities have adopted musculoskeletal ultrasound. Institutions that you heard of, Henry Ford, University of Michigan, Thomas Jefferson, Hospital for Special Surgery, WashU, just to name a few. But really, in the last 10 years, we've seen exponential growth in MSK ultrasound. I'll tell you why. Improved technology. We're hearing about improved technology, emerging technology that's really driving innovation. Shear wave is one of them. Real-time dynamic capability of ultrasound is really the advantage of ultrasound over other static imaging modalities like MRI and CT. And so patients derive a lot of satisfaction because there's a lot of patient-doctor interaction uh, at the bedside. And really, the dynamic capability is, is what stands out in musculoskeletal imaging. Ultrasound-guided procedures and the low cost and portability. But ultrasound-guided procedures is something that's been really driving MSK ultrasound just because of its portability. You can see here a bursal injection into the shoulder bursa of someone who had impingement and shoulder pain. What does the diagnostic MSK ultrasound volume look like in the United States over the past 10 years? This is uh, a chart that was derived from the Journal of ACR 2012, Thomas Jefferson Institute. And if you can see here, from 2001 to 2009, the volume in MSK ultrasound increased amongst radiologists. Um, and you can see that on the y-axis, that's, that's the numbers in thousands. Whereas non-radiologists, for example, podiatrists, you see a huge increase, about 1,000, over 1,000, close to 2,000 percent over the past 10 years. A lot of it is portability, um, low cost. And then all other health providers, you can see there's a modest increase. But what's the future of MSK ultrasound? People ask me this, and you know, because utilization is increasing with ultrasound, the Affordable Care Act, as you know, is flipping as far as now here with training with orthopedic surgery, MRIs being dominant, orthopedic surgeon training, residency, know about MRI, not so much ultrasound, but that's flipping on its head now, as you can see. And so over the next 10 years, you're gonna see a projection of ultrasound growth. Here is an example, it's a busy chart, but if you can concentrate on ultrasound right there, this was derived from an independent marketing group that um, consulted for uh, the Healthcare Act. You can see over the next five years, is a 14% growth in ultrasound. Over the next 10 years, you're gonna see a 30% growth in ultrasound. So we're gonna see this continu continued trend, especially musculoskeletal imaging. We're seeing it now. Uh, 10 years ago when I got into it, people were saying, you're crazy, musculoskeletal MRI is where it's at. However, in the last three to five years, we're seeing a lot of people interested in musculoskeletal ultrasound. So what are the current limitations? How can shear wave elastography help or add value? Well, right now, we rely on di diagnostic evaluation to diagnose your tendinopathy, your tendon tears, um, bursitis. So we, we look at morphology. Is your tendon thickened? And I'll show you examples of that. Is there echo texture change? Are there tears? Um, those, are, those are information that's somewhat reliable. Um, the literature has proven this with surgical correlation over the last 10 years. 
we can add Doppler. That's been an innovation in technology that helps, ha has helped driven ultrasound. Uh, mainly for hyperemia, if there's inflammation, it can increase your specificity for uh, tendon pain or muscle pain. But really, there's no biomechanical information. That would make sense in tendons and muscle mechanics, right? Biomechanical information. That's what attracted us uh, to look at shear wave elastography as another quantitative measure, so more objective. It takes the subjectivity of a musculoskeletal radiologist with 10 years of training out of the equation, and maybe you can be more objective to diagnose tendon injury, um, maybe predict tendon injury or progression of tear. So here's an example. I chose the Achilles tendon to show you an example because that is by far and away the largest tendon in the body, the most injured tendon in the body, and you're probably familiar with the Achilles. Here's a sagittal MRI. I'm going to turn this sideways. It's just to match um, the position of the patient when we scan them in the prone position. Okay. So a typical ultrasound image of the Achilles looks like this. You can see the bony acoustic landmark where I labeled calcaneus. You can see the nice Achilles tendon. So this is normal. It's, it's uniform in echo texture and size. There's no echo texture change, no tear, right? There's a little bit of bursitis, retrocalcaneal bursitis is what we we'll call it, um, probably responsible for this patient's pain. But over the course of a year, and this is what is the natural history of tendon degeneration, this tendon gets thicker. That's all I can tell you, that this is mild tendinopathy possibly, but what's the biomechanical information that we can get from this? Now, if I'm confused, if that's really real or not, I can always compare to the other asymptomatic side. You can see how that looks normal, right? You can see power Doppler. That's an area where, you know, you turn on Doppler. If there's hyperemia, you know, that increases your specificity. But these are the things that I rely on to diagnose your mild tendinopathy. Now, if I can place shear wave speed on there to see an objective measure, okay, this is tendinopathy that may progress to healing, or you may need to think about surgical management. Those are the decisions that you know, we struggle with. So here is another case, a 55-year-old female, different Achilles tendon. You can see what happens over time if you don't uh, choose the right management pathway. You can see how the tendon now is becoming more boggy, it's thicker, you can tell Maybe from back there it might be hard, but the echo texture has changed. What happens? Well, in a different patient, um, you can see the tendon gets much thicker. You can see a tear, a partial tear. That's where it usually starts. And then eventually, maybe that may lead to a complete tear. The two torn tendon ends as we stretch it apart to confirm our diagnosis of a complete tear. But could we have predicted that before it got to this point? Could we have you know, added some value, maybe a shear wave can do that. So this quantitative measure, you know, we're trying to estimate the elasticity or the inherent elasticity of the tissue, the soft tissue in kilopascal or Young's modulus. We know that the shear wave velocity, as you've been hearing, correlates with stiffness of the tendon and muscle is what we're looking at in this application. Here's an example that uh, my postdoc gave me, uh, thermoablation. So this is a pig liver. They did microwave ablation, and you can see, you know, on the grayscale, what zone, the question they had is what zone was, was, was uh, killed through the thermal ablation. And with the shear wave elastography, you can pretty much tell the areas of stiffness and hardness um, that nicely demarcated the area of stiffness change. The literature review, unlike the nice presentation on breast, not as mature, but it's emerging as we're seeing more application of musculoskeletal ultrasound. These are just an example of what we've seen. Um, these are shear wave um, elastography, which is more repeatable. Um, I, in the past, five years ago when I started this, I kind of dabbled in strain elastography, and the struggle that I had was a repeatability. I couldn't repeat my results, so that was quite frustrating. Whereas in here, it's showing that there may be some repeatability. So here's an example of what we're looking at in an ex vivo, very controlled animal model. You can see the elastogram. You'll, I'm not sure if it projects well back there, but you can see the shear wave propagating through the normal tendon. You can see the corresponding elastogram above, pretty uniform in velocity. You can see what we did is induce a partial tear. And so what we're looking at is to see if the strain changes or the stiffness changes um, with subsequent tear. You can see 
the, the shear wave propagating through this. So we have a tendon tear model. We're looking at a collagenase model because collagenase is an enzyme that degrades tendon to mimic tendinopathy. This is the best model that we have because there's no good animal model. You can see here that the shear wave, as it goes through you know, an area that we injected the tendon, on the B mode, you can't see it, but maybe with shear wave, you can see this pretty well. Here's our partial tear model. We just finished this um, experiment, and it was accepted for publication in the Journal of Ultrasound Medicine and Biology. You can see here the partial undersurface tear of the ex vivo tendon. The corresponding um, uh, shear wave imaging elastogram on the right side shows that there are definite velocity changes, shear wave speed changes, as we're looking at the area of the cut, the area before the tear, and the area after the tear. There are changes that we're seeing with ultrasound. So this is exciting because before, I didn't see anything like this until I was able to explore with this. Next, we're doing a tendinopathy model. Now this is, it took me a year to figure out how to have focal tendinopathy, because when I injected the colonase, collagenase, it would just spread throughout the tendon. So we clamped it, injected the collagenase, and we could mimic tendinopathy. That's all we cared about. So we can see areas of demarcation with the shear wave speed elastography. You can see here in the corresponding elastogram, the area nicely um, demarcating lower shear wave speeds, unlike the normal sides on either side. If you look at um, the left versus right and then the region of interest, you can see definitely from the control, which is injection of saline in the green, was definitely different than the area of softness that we, we saw in collagenase. Our next experiment now is gonna be using collagenase as a background with the setting of a tear because that's what happens to us physiologically. So we did explore um, uh, in vivo areas, uh, shear wave elastography, so we actually scan humans. Um, look here, this is a long axis view or extended field of view of the Achilles tendon. I know it's a busy slide, but if you look at, um, that's the soleus muscle, gastrocnemius muscle, and you can see the Achilles tendon here pretty nicely as it thins out from distal to proximal. And so you can see here in the upper left image our, just the diagram of our scanning pathway of the Achilles. And what we found was that the shear weight, this is in a group of normal young uh, asymptomatic patients. So what does the shear wave speed look like in the normal Achilles? Now the nor young is 18 to 25. Sounds really young nowadays. So here you can see from region one, which corresponds to the far left image, I'm gonna use this pointer here, far left image, region one, you can see the shear wave speed was highest in this region and then progressively decreased as we went proximally along the normal Achilles tendon. That was an interesting finding. So. We also looked at this in different ankle uh, positions. So the plantar flexion, the neutral position, or, and the dorsiflexion. And we found that in the plantar flexed or relaxed Achilles tendon state, that the shear wave speed in the normal asymptomatic group was lower than in the neutral and in the dorsiflex. So that was an interesting finding. So our next follow-up to this is looking at the middle age and then finally, finally the older age asymptomatic Achilles, just to see if there's uh, differences in age-related changes of the normal Achilles tendon, and if that could be useful information later on down the line. So then lastly, translation of shear wave elastography. Uh, as I told you before, may be useful in characterizing these MSK lesions quantitatively, um, having a biomechanical information. Here is an example of a patient of ours that came through the door with tennis elbow. So this. LE stands for the lateral epicondyle, RH stands for the radial head. So this is the outside part of your elbow. So people with tennis elbow, you can see here the tendon, small area of hypoechogenicity, so tendinopathy. And then on the elastogram, it showed corresponding low shear wave speed. Maybe that's um, an area that corresponds and we can pick that up with quantitative measurement. Here's an example of another patient, more diffuse tendinopathy on the right. You can see if you look in the region of interest, in general, lower shear wave speeds throughout the entire thing, rather than on the asymptomatic normal left side, on average, it was much higher normal shear wave speed measurements. So this could be a powerful tool. You know, it has some way to go. But other things that we could do is follow injury, healing, evaluate different therapies. You know, we um, 
are also doing studies on platelet-rich plasma therapy for tendon and muscle injuries. So those, you know, can we monitor tendon healing with that? Maybe predict impending tendon injuries in our high-level athletes um, would be an important information, but more MSK studies are needed. So this is my talk. Any questions? Thank you.